going to continue on learning about Samuel. Good to see everybody today. We are going to be in chapter 7, 1 Samuel chapter 7. Brother Bobby had to work today, so you're going to have to put up with me three times. I feel bad about that. I'll apologize in advance. I'll apologize in advance. Just kind of a review. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 all the way through this chapter 7. Samuel was established by God to be a prophet of the Lord. He uh, stayed close to God even in less than desirable circumstances. All those around him uh, were not doing the right things. They were uh, in trouble with the Lord. They were trying to get the people to do things that they ought not do. Matter of fact, it got so bad that they actually made the people detest giving to the Lord. They actually made the people detest their offerings and sacrifices unto the Lord because these uh, two men were so wicked. And Samuel was raised in the midst of this. The preacher of that time, Eli, did not do his job in making sure his sons did the right thing. He should have fired them. Uh, that's easier said than done. I understand all those things. But uh, Eli, according to the Lord, the Lord told him, look, you are preferring your sons over me. And uh, of course, Eli should not have done that. Uh, and, and let me go ahead and stop there for a minute. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, the family and I understand all those things. But when it comes to godliness, God is not going to be mocked. He's not going to change his mind because of our relationships. God wants us to be godly. That's the beginning and end of it. He has a desire for all of us to be godly. He has a desire for all of us uh, to do what he's asked us to do. And by the way, it always works out for our benefit when we are godly. You may not see it at the time, but believe me, it always works out for our benefit. Samuel was raised in the midst of all of this chaos and and yet Samuel became just a great judge for the Lord. He became a great man for the Lord. So he's in the midst of all this. Now this battle takes place. The Lord turns over the Israelites into the Philistines' hands because they're not doing uh, what they're supposed to be doing. And please understand, I believe there's a reckoning for every everything that we do that's not godly. We may not see it. And this is a scary thing. God is so long-suffering and so merciful and so patient. There are times that he does not raise his hand against us or do things against us or chasten us. And it's very difficult to determine what, what happens in our lives, whether it be a chastening of the Lord or redirection from the Lord or just things happening in our lives. You could be doing all the right things and still have bad things happen in your life. But I will tell you this, I would certainly want to be doing the right things in my life. That way, if it is a chastening from the Lord, I know there'll be a swift end or I hope there's a swift end to it because I want to stay close to the Lord and I want to do what I can. Now, all of the all of this wraps up into Samuel and Samuel now is uh, kind of uh, got put in charge because the Philistines have taken the ark. The ark has been with uh, the Philistines now for quite a while. Brother Bobby talked about the Emrods last week. It was one of the greatest stories in the whole wide world. I get the biggest kick out of the Lord giving people hemorrhoids. I just do. Uh, I, I just get the... My... my, my I, I read the Bible and I chuckle. I, I just do. They made golden images of these things as an offering. Who was the sculptor? Come on. You know, and I, this may be disgusting, but it is what it is. This is what makes me laugh. Somebody had to get a subject. Who was the sculptor? What a job that would be to be commissioned to do that. So they made them and they sent these mice and they sent these, uh, they called them emeralds, but they're hemorrhoids. It's, it's an almost embarrassing thing to say, but it is what it is. They sent it uh, over and they're trying to get rid of this ark. And uh, the ark has now been with the Philistines for uh, 20 years. And uh, they've got this, uh, uh, they desire to turn back to the Lord. And so this is where we kind of left off last week. Uh, uh, the Lord smote over 50,000 men. Uh, if you look over and... Um, 
oh, let's say uh, verse 19 of chapter 6. Let's start there. Verse 19 of chapter 6 of 1 Samuel. He smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up? From us, and they sent messengers into the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerim, saying, "The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you." Seven verse one. And the men of Kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was. 20 years, 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. This is the moment where you can just about interject the words, what have we done? Now, you might think that it's all, oh, come on, this is easy to see. I, I, this easy, to, you know what, I got to be honest with you. The longer I live, the more I see, and, and please listen, if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this. The longer I live, the more I see bits, just bits or bites or slivers of Christianity being taken away. And what happens is this. We don't see it as any big deal. We see it as, uh, uh, and, and I'm just going to use this as an example because sadly we may have to do this someday, but it's not because I want to. I like having pews in a church. Now, this is going to sound simple to you, right? Dumb, right? But whatever. I like having pews in church. It's a traditional thing. Okay? And I know it's a man's tradition. But I don't want theater seating in my church house. Why? Because stuff is being just slivered away little by little. Hymn books are disappearing in churches all across America. Hymn books are disappearing. We're buying new ones. Amen? Good ones, by the way. Not, not, not new junk. Good ones. OK, with the old hymns in them. OK, so we're, we're doing that. We're sticking to the old book. We're not changing our Bible. OK, those, those simple things. We have altar calls. Now you say, well, well, of course, we're used to that here. There's churches all across America don't do that. Why? Because it's being nipped away and nipped away and nipped away until you have Akron Baptist Temple. Akron Baptist Temple didn't just turn into that overnight. And by the way, don't tell me it can't be turned back. The big problem is people write it off. I'm going to tell you, if you'd set an independent, fundamental, blood-washed, fire-breathing Baptist preacher in there, he could turn that place around. Why? Because that was God's house. It was God's house, and God's man used to be in that house. Several of God's men were in that house. And now it's gone. What happened? It got whittled away. It got whittled away. And if you look at Israel over the years, you watch them, they start to get worse and worse and worse. Why? Because they go away from the old past. Less and less people, just a little bit here and there. To the precept of learning the Bible is here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Learning the Bible a little at a time. It is exactly the same in reverse. Very seldom do you see somebody just go off the deep end, just jump off the cliff. Usually they take a lot of steps before they get there. What happens? I, we just don't learn our Bible like we used to. Why do you think your preacher challenges you all the time to read your Bible? Don't take my word for it. Read your Bible. Because if you know what the truth is, you don't have to worry about me telling you what the truth is. So you look at this and they've lost the ark. And now the people of Israel have come to the point where... I cannot believe we've gotten to where we've gotten. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're living in a country that's doing the same thing. Whittling away at everything good and godly. You know, it's amazing how they're getting away with it because times are good. You can't complain about the economy anymore. You can't complain about jobs. You can't complain about gas prices. You can't, there's nothing, right now everything's good, so nobody needs God. I would caution you to realize you always need him. Don't you walk away from him. I don't care how good your times are. Man, my pension's working out. Uh, everything's going well with my money. And it's amazing how people equate financial wealth 
to being good. I know a lot of folks that make a lot of money that don't do a thing for God. Oh boy, okay, I'll move on. Get back to the hemorrhoids, preacher. Now, verse chapter 7 and verse 3. They want the ark back, and here it is. And by the way, there's no shortcuts in your life. I'm going to read you some verses here. There's no shortcuts to this. This is what happens. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, the Bible says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do, return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Now, I want you to stop there for a moment, because if you have to return to him, you must not be with him. I, I know I try to read the Bible as logically as possible. He is accusing Israel of having to return to the Lord. And if he's accusing them of having to return, then they must be away. Correct? All right. So the folks that want to tell you, I'm really not away from the Lord. I'm not away from him. Well, they suffered all these years, 20 years. The ark is gone. And, and before that, they're losing men in battles because God's not with them. They've been gone from God for a while. And now Samuel's saying, look, if you return unto the Lord, but he adds something there. If you do return unto the Lord with what? See, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. I'm going to try to help you today. And, and by the way, it's not for any other reason. But to try to remind you how good God has been to us. Help me. Well, I know there's tragedies in folks' lives. I understand that. But boy, I sure am glad to get to face the tragedies with God. I don't want to face the tragedies against him or without him. So, yes, I understand that the bad things happen. I get all those things. But he does not say, if you'll start coming to church. Stay with me now. It does not say, if you'll start reading your Bible. It says that if you'll turn to God, return to him with all your heart. Now, the, what, they're say, what he's saying is you're wanting to get right. Welcome to Sunday school. Happy Mother's Day. He's saying you're wanting to get right. Now, not, not very many pulpits anymore preach about getting right. I'm not talking about getting right to what you think is right. Bobby will be back next week. I'm not talking about what we think is right. I'm talking about what God thinks is right. What does the Bible say is right? Because if we get back to, if we want to give God all of our heart, doesn't that necessarily mean that we're going to have to get back to this? I'm not talk, talking about reading it. By the way, Everything you do for God is a symptom of where your heart is. Everything you do, by the way, is a symptom of where your heart is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I I'm going to give you some examples. Are you ready? You're going to love them. This is a symptom of where your heart is. You might get mad, but it's the truth of it. This is a symptom of where your heart is. Any myriad of things can get in the way of your heart to stop you from putting in here. You always preach about money. I got a million things going on here. We need it. But that's not the point. The point is, where's your heart? See, your heart, how much you get into this is a symptom of where your heart is. Amen? Amen. Samuel gives them the directive, if you want to start doing right, you're going to have to give him all of your heart. Amen? You're going to have to turn over who you are to him. Oh, that doesn't sound fun at all. You know what? I have never been happier than serving God. Never. Oh, you do it out of duty. You're a preacher. You know, you can say that duty demands it. Oh, bless God, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's a tremendous message, and it really, really is. I enjoy this. I want to do this. I want to see God smile upon these people. I want to have a problem with my parking. I want to have just every day something's going on. This is not a lie. 
I want more church, not less. I don't want, oh, bless God, preacher, don't push your people more than three days. I got to be honest with you, where our hearts are is what we're going to do. And you can't lie about it because you know it in your... You can say, oh, I'm tired and I know, you know what we are, because I believe we work more hours today than we've ever worked in all of history. I think we work more now than we've ever worked. I'm talking about working for an employer. I, I know men that are putting in 60, 70 hours a week, and then their wives are also putting in 40 to 50 hours a week just to try to make their ends meet. I understand that what is happening, but where our heart is will definitely specify what we do with our time. All right, now hold on. So Samuel speaks unto all the house of Israel, and he says, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then there's some things you're going to have to do. Then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Now this is amazing to me that he's talking to Israel. He's not talking to the Gentiles. He's not talking to the barbarians. He's talking to Israel. Now, we also remember studying about this back in the king's day that God told them to rid the land of all, all of these inhabitants. If they don't do it, they're going to be a snare unto you. Their religions will be a thorn unto you. What's amazing to me is they don't do what God says. Are we then shocked at what the result is? So put away the strange gods. Why? Because you have them. Well, wait a minute, preacher. I don't have anything like that. I don't have any concrete statues in my yard. I don't have any gods in my life. Be very careful. Because an idol is anything that gets between you and what you need to do for God. I, I, happy Mother's Day. But it's the truth of it. The truth of it is anything that would come between you and what you need to do for God has become an idol. It's become, and I know that we have a lot of work to do and I understand that you have to support your family. I'm not, I'm not telling you to stop doing that. What I'm telling you is, where can, we, where can we make God the priority? And then let everything else fall in place behind. Oh, well, this isn't going over well. I'll be nicer in Sunday morning, I promise. He says, if you do return with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Asheroth from among you and prepare your hearts... Unto the Lord. Now I want you to notice the order. The order is get rid of all the garbage and then get your heart ready for God to do something in your life. I personally believe that you can't do the second without the first. You cannot get your heart ready and keep the other. Samuel's not, he's not giving you his thoughts. He's giving you God's thoughts. And God says, put away these things out of your life and get your heart ready to do something for God. Now, again, we go back to the fact that you line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. This is how you learn the Bible. This is how you learn Christianity. This is how you learn just about anything in your life. The reverse is also true. We talked about that earlier. But we must understand that if we're going to get closer to the Lord, getting yourself ready. I'll give you a great example. You came to church this morning. I hope that you prayed at least for a moment before you came that I would have something that you needed to give to you for God today. What do you mean by that preacher? Well, I don't, I hope and pray you don't come to church just for uh, gawking at a good looking preacher. Because if you did, you came to the wrong building. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say this. You need to prepare yourself to come to church. Now, a lot, a lot of folks are lost on that. They come to church because that's what they do. And I'm glad of that. I'm glad you made that such a part of your life that it's what you do. But understand this, coming to church is not a spectator sport. Being a, a, a person that would say, you know what, please bless the preacher today. Bless the bus routes today. Bless the Sunday school teachers today. Bless the kids today. Let us have a baptism today. Let us get somebody saved today. What are you doing? You're preparing your heart to go to church. You're getting yourself, what happens in every morning? And it is literally almost every single person. How does everybody get along on the way to church? It's amazing to me that there's things that come in our lives, happens on Sunday morning, irritants, 
things that happen to draw our attention away from what we're doing. And it doesn't even matter about fighting. It doesn't matter about arguing. It doesn't, that doesn't even, it is even the simplest little things. Oh, my coffee pot didn't work. Bless God, some folks wouldn't even come to church if they couldn't get their coffee pot to work. But those things that if we can prepare our hearts, put away those things for a minute and just sit there and say, hey, Lord, I'd love to have a good day in church. And it's not just about church. It's about every day. What can I see God do today? What can I look for today? Lord, prepare me to see you in a real way today so I can be blessed by what you're. Now, look, if you can do those things and prepare your hearts to be with him for the day, I believe we will do a lot less straying from what God wants us to do. Amen. All right. Put away the strange gods for, for, uh, and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about service. We got folks in here that serve God relentlessly. But serving God is the most fun I have. I love it. And by the way, it pays eternal dividends to serve him. But that's not why we do it. We do it. Why? Because we prepared our heart. We do it. Why? Because that's what we want to do. It's a desire of ours is to serve God. You want to see an excitable church, go to a church that wants to serve God. Everybody wants to serve God. You want to run a bus route. I mean, can you imagine? Think about this. Buses are insane today. If you think about the principle of a bus route, it makes no sense. Think with me just for a moment. By the way, what an exciting day. <laughs> years and years and years ago, uh, and some of, some of the uh, ones that have been here for a while will remember, uh, my wife and I went to try to go out yesterday. My wife's uh, birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, sweetheart. 25 years old. Uh, and so we, we went out and we tried to go get a steak dinner. And uh, by the time we got uh, to the steak dinner, 430, which is early for most folks. I, I'm, I'm pretty much a senior citizen when it comes to eating. And uh, so we go to this place. It, she walks in and walks right back out. And there's the 800 people sitting in the foyer the wait was too long so we decided okay let's let's do the next best thing and go get a crummy steak sandwich from a mall that's deserted so we decided to go to this mall chapel hill if you haven't been there in a while there's hardly anybody there anymore. mall walkers or who's in there now and so um we go in there and and we get a, a steak sandwich and we're uh in the line for the steak sandwich and, and it's crazy because if you knew what we went through just to get to the place where we couldn't eat then have to go back to a place that i didn't want to go but it's what we wanted to do. Chick-fil-A, no, no, let's not go there. Let's go eat crummy food. So we went over here to this steak joint and steak sandwich joint, which is not steak at all. So we, we go in there and this girl is behind the counter and she is uh, ringing us out. And I looked at us, man, she looks familiar. And uh, I, I asked her, I said, is your name Virginia? She looked at me. Yes, because remember, I look like a detective or a lawyer. She says, yes. I said, my soul, you rode our buses when you were a little baby girl. You were there with for when she was seven, eight years old. And what a troubled child, troubled child, had a rough life. It was amazing to me. And I personally, this is what I believe, that the Lord steered my wife and I. I mean, it, it, if you would have been with us, it was insane that we would have ended up there. And so to talk to that girl and I talked, she was troubled. Oh, my goodness. I remember her. She she had to sit with Tawny Popel every single service because she was just so troubled. Her home life was just not good. But I love this afterwards. And, I, and we left. So good to see you, man. I was, I was so glad to see you. And she says, good to see you, too. And we, so we walked over and ate our sandwiches and then we we walked around a little bit longer and I, it was unbelievable we we walked around for a minute and i and we said, well let's let's stop at the restroom before we get in the car and so we were walking down the hallway to go to the restroom and she comes out the door you got to be kidding me and so i said all right i said hey how old are you because the last time i saw her she's just a little baby she says i'm 26 
That means I'm old. I said, man, that's wonderful. And she says, I have a three-year-old son. And she starts flipping through pictures to show me her son. Oh, look at her son. And she told me. And then she made this statement. And, I, and boy, she made the statement to me. She says, I remember the man that had no fingers. Well, Larry Brummett was missing a couple on his hand. I remember the girl that used to sit with me every service. They were my favorites, which was Tawny. And I said, yeah, that's wonderful. I said, Robert has a church in Holland now. Uh, they, they've been there for a while. They're doing great. And I said, uh, I, I don't see uh, Brother Larry much anymore. But from what I understand, they're doing good. I, man, it was good to see you. Today. It's just so exciting to see you. She says, yeah, I would love to get my son involved in something like you have. And I said, I would love for your son to get involved in something like we have. She says, he's not quite ready yet. And it dawned on me because he's three. He have to be five to get on the bus. I understood what she was saying. And I said, well, where do you live? And she says, I live about 30 seconds from me. I know that'd be a long drive to come all the way from the falls. But I said, man, it sure was really good to see you. I'd love to see you again. I thought to myself, you know what? It, it is truly amazing what God will do. And you may not think that's any big deal, but to me, that little girl went walking away. Man, that man remembered who I was from all that time ago. That, that little girl that was so troubled. And she, I mean, she's an adult now. But boy, isn't it wonderful how God can work things out? If we look for it. A lot of times we go through our every day and we just our blinders are on and we don't see the goodness of God because our blinders are on and we're busy and we don't think about it. Well, man, if we would start out our day, hey, Lord, show me something. Let me see your goodness so I can get closer to you. I believe that if we can do that and ask God and talk to God, and if you think that God doesn't want to prove himself to you, I believe you're crazy. Samuel says, give him all your heart, put away the strange gods, prepare your hearts, serve him only, and he will deliver you. What are you struggling with today? By the way, this doesn't just work for the Israelites. This works for everybody. For everything. You can use this formula to help you get out of what you're in every time. What do you mean, preacher? Believe me, this is real simple. I'll help you out. You need to return to him. Whatever you're going through, you need to return to him. By the way, you'll know it because you're sensing it right now. You'll know it because you'll know where your heart is. Nobody has to tell you where your heart is. God's already told you where your heart is. I don't have to stand up and browbeat you. You know where your heart is. Look at this. Return unto the Lord with all your heart. Give him all your heart. All of your heart. Not half, not three quarter, not I'll try it out and see how it goes, preacher. Give him your heart. Give him a shot. You give a shot to anything else and you give him everything you got. Give God your heart. Just let him have a shot at it. Serving God is wonderful. Put away the strange gods. That's not just putting away statues. That's putting away anything that keeps you from giving your heart to him. Help me. Boy, this isn't going over very well. Prepare your heart unto him. This all has to do with your heart, by the way. And serve him only. Well, that doesn't sound fun at all. It's the greatest thing you ever do. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. It works for everything in the whole wide world. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I have trouble, trouble with alcohol, preacher. Give him your heart. Turn from that idol. What's your idol, alcohol? Turn from it. Give him your heart. Turn from that and go to him. Prepare your heart to serve him. You can't serve him with a bottle of beer in your hand. What happens in our life is we don't want to hear this kind of preaching. We don't want to hear that I have to give up so that I have to do something different in my life to go ahead and serve God. And it may not be any of the bad things. It may be the good things. But what they've become is a pulling away like a tug of war in our lives. I want to be blessed by God. Well, you're not going to be blessed by God allowing what's stopping you from being blessed by God to tug you in that wrong direction. How in the world did Israel ever lose the ark? They lost the ark because they lost their eyes on God. The ark was not this great power. Uh, it was a symbol. It was a symbol of God and his relationship with Israel. And if I could 
tell you this today, my soul, it is so wonderful having that relationship with him that you know that no matter what you go through, he's in control. If you could get that part of it, this part of these verses, I think it'll help your lives tremendously. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for what you've done. So glad that the nation finally repents under the leadership of Samuel. Samuel prays for them. He judges them. Philistines try to come back after them, but this time, Lord, you beat them back. Why? Because their hearts were on you. The enemy had no chance if you're involved. Oh, God, please help us to realize that this is not just a hobby. This is something that can be life-changing. It can help our lives, Lord, because you'd be in control. You're the one that's all-powerful. You're the one that knows everything. Lord, please help us today to look to you. Help us today on this Mother's Day to look to you. Just, just give what we've got to you. Just, just allow you to have it. Prove. Prove you. Lord, you're so wonderful. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. We love you. And we sure do thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.